from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Floating Head I was introduced to the Reverend Joseph Murphy, an Irish clergyman, just prior to World War I, when researching on some hauntings in Scotland. A story Mr. Murphy and his wife told me was outside the compass of my investigations, so I did not go further with it then. But here it is now, from my notebook, and in the retelling I see again the earnest faces of the elderly Parsons and his wife as they relived for me, after some twenty-five years, a night they could never forget. One summer evening, early in the 1880s, Mr. Murphy and his wife, who were touring Scotland for the first time, arrived in Dundee. Not knowing where to put up for the night, and knowing no one in the city to whom they could apply for information, they bought a local paper, and from the list of hotels and boarding houses advertised in it, selected an inn near the Perth Road as being the one most likely to meet their modest requirements. They were certainly not disappointed with the exterior of the hotel they had chosen, for as soon as they saw it they exclaimed together, What a delightful old place! Old it certainly was, for the mid-gabled oak constructions and projecting windows unquestionably indicated the 16th century. Nor did the interior impress them less favorably. The rooms were large and low-ceilinged, and the ceilings, walls, floors, and staircase were all made of oak. The diamond lattice windows and narrow passages and innumerable nooks and crannies and cupboards created an atmosphere of quaintness and comfort that irresistibly appealed to the couple. In spite of this welcome atmosphere, however, Mrs. Murphy had certain misgivings as to how the place would strike her at night. Though not nervous, naturally, and by no means superstitious, she was not without that feeling of uneasiness, which many people experience when passing the night in strange quarters. The room they engaged, I cannot say selected, as the hotel being full, Mr. Murphy and his wife had Hobson's choice, was at the back of the house, at the end of a very long passage, and overlooked the yard. It was a large room, and in one of its several recesses stood the bed, a gigantic ebony four-poster with spotlessly clean valance, and what was of more importance, well-aired sheets. The other furniture was much the same as that to be found in the majority of old-fashioned hostels, but a mixture in the shape of a cupboard, a deep, dark cupboard, led into the wall facing the bed, immediately attracted Mrs. Murphy's attention. She poked about it inside the cupboard for some moments, and then, apparently satisfied that it was a perfectly ordinary one, continued on a general investigation of the room. Her husband did not assist, pleading tiredness. He sat in a corner of the bed, munching and reading the Dundee advertiser, till she had done. He then helped his wife unpack her suitcase. In doing this, they whiled away so much time in conversation that both were startled when the clock of an adjacent church solemnly boomed twelve. They straight away prepared for bed. I wish we had a night light, Joseph, Mrs. Murphy said as she got up from her pears. I suppose it wouldn't do to keep one of the candles burning. I'm not exactly afraid, but I don't fancy being left in the dark. She then admitted, I had a curious feeling when looking in the cupboard. I can't explain it, but I feel now that I would like the light left burning. It certainly is rather a gloomy room, her husband agreed, raising his eyes to the black oak ceiling. And I agree with you, it would be nice if we had a night light, or better still, gas. But, 
as we have it, my dear, we shall be on our feet a good deal tomorrow. I think we ought to try and get to sleep as soon as possible. He blew out the candle as he spoke and got into bed. A long hush followed, broken only by the sound of their breathing and the occasional ticking as of some long-legged creature on the wall and window blind. Mrs. Murphy could never remember afterwards if she actually went to sleep, but she is sure her husband did, as she distinctly heard him snore, and the sound which so irritated her as a rule was very welcome to her then. She was lying listening to it and wishing with all her soul she could go to sleep when she suddenly became aware of a smell, a most offensive pungent odor which blew across the room and crept up her nostrils. The cold perspiration of fear at once broke out on her forehead. Objectionable as the smell was, it suggested something more horrible. She thought several times of rousing her husband, but remembering how tired he had been, she desisted and with all of her senses, keenly on alert, lay awake and listened. The quiet of the night was disturbed by various intermediate noises. Creaks and footsteps, rustlings as of drapery, sighs and whisperings, all very faint and suggestive, though probably attributable to natural causes. But over and above these, Mrs. Murphy caught herself, why she could not say, waiting for some definite manifestation of what she instinctively felt was near at hand. She could not locate it. She could only speculate on its whereabouts, and it was somewhere in the direction of the cupboard. And each time the offensive smell came to her, the conviction that its origin was in the cupboard grew. At last, unable to bear the suspense any longer, she got softly out of bed and creeping stealthily forward found her way with surprisingly little difficulty, considering it was pitch dark and the room was unfamiliar to her to the cupboard. With every step she took, the smell increased, until by the time she reached the cupboard, she was almost suffocated. For some seconds she toyed irresolutely with the door handle, longing to be back in bed, but was unable to tear herself away from the cupboard. At last, yielding to the demands of some exacting influence, she held her breath and swung open the door. The moment she did so, a faint glow of decay filtered into the room and she saw exactly opposite her, a human head floating in midair. Petrified with terror and unable to cry out, she stared at it. That it was the head of a man, she could only guess from the matted crop of short red hair that fell in disordered entanglements over the upper part of the forehead and ears. All else was lost in a disgusting mass of decomposition. On the thing beginning to move forward, the spell that bound her to the floor was broken, and with a cry of horror, she fled to the bed and awoke her husband. The head was by this time close to them, and had not Mrs. Murphy dragged her husband forcibly out of its way, it would have touched him. His terror, as he freely admitted to me, was even greater than hers. But for the moment, neither could speak. They stood clutching one another in awful silence. Mrs. Murphy at length cast out. Pray, Joseph, pray, command the thing in the name of God to depart. Her husband made a desperate effort to do so, but not a syllable would come. The head now veered round and moved swiftly towards them, its stench causing them both to struggle for breath. Mr. Murphy, seizing his walking stick, lashed at it with all his strength, but the stick met with no resistance, and still the head continued to advance. The couple then made a frantic attempt to find the door, the head still pursuing them and tripping over something in their wild haste, they fell together on the floor. The head approached until it hovered immediately above them and then, descending lower and lower, finally passed right through them, through the floor and out of sight. It was some minutes before either of them could sufficiently recover to stir from the floor, and when they did move it was only to totter to their bed and lie there shivering till morning. The hot morning sun dissipating their fears, they got up and hurried downstairs to demand an interview with the landlord. When they told him their story, he scoffed at it and argued that it must have been a nightmare. But the couple showed the absurdity of this by firmly attesting 
they had both been simultaneously experiencing the phenomena. The landlord, however, still stoutly denied there was anything wrong with the room. It was only as the Murphys were about to leave the hotel that he finally approached them, probably because of Mr. Murphy being a churchman. To their surprise, he then offered them another room, on any terms they liked, if only they would complete their stay at the end and not talk about the incident. I know every word of what you say is true, he confessed to them, but what am I to do? I can't shut up a house which I have taken on a 20-year lease because one room is haunted, and after all, there is only one visitor in dozens who is disturbed by the apparition. The head, he explained, was said to be that of a peddler who was murdered in the inn more than a hundred years ago. His decapitated body was found hidden behind the wainscoting and his head under the cupboard floor. The murderers were never caught and were supposed to have gone down in a ship that sailed from the port of Dundee just about that time and was never heard of again. Mr. and Mrs. Murphy, kind souls that they were, relented and agreed to continue their short stay at the hotel in another room. In the years afterward, they seldom spoke of their experience beyond the family circle until through a friend I met them and persuaded them to tell it all to me. Rebecca of Bethlehem the Hospital of the Star of Bethlehem was a fine-sounding name for London's first lunatic asylum, but it quickly became notorious under the more widely used and chilling slang name of Bedlam. The asylum actually began life in a converted priory on the site of the present Liverpool Street Station. In the 18th century, however, the still primitively kept and controlled madhouse had moved to Moorfields, and it is there that the opening scene for our next case is set. It is perhaps difficult to imagine a more extraordinary background for a haunting than a lunatic asylum, which is why the melancholy tale of one of its inmates, known as Rebecca, has attracted some writers to offer their fictional versions of it. However, the facts as I was able to investigate them are bizarre enough. In the year 1780, a handsome young man from the East Indies came to London and took lodging in the house of a city merchant on Fish Street Hill, close to London Bridge. The merchant at this time happened to have his employ a very plain and shy maidservant called Rebecca. The girl loved poetry, especially romantic poetry, and often when in bed used to lie awake thinking over what she had read. She was frequently heard repeating aloud to herself certain lines which she had memorized. Hence, it may be deduced that she was both imaginative and impressionable, the sort of girl who might easily fall in love and fall deeply. This she did. The new lodger, gay and casual by disposition, possessed in addition much charm of manner and the kindliness with which he treated Rebecca, who was not accustomed to very much consideration, completely won her heart. In no time at all she became hopelessly infatuated. Instead of repeating lines of poetry in bed at night, she would lie awake repeating his name and, according to witnesses, conjuring up his image. Yet, so reserved was Rebecca that the young man had not the slightest suspicion she was in love with him. Instead, he scarcely thought of her at all. She inspired no sentiment whatever in him. She was just another domestic, civil, obliging, and hard-working but very plain. Rebecca, however, magnified the lodger's casual, non-significant and ordinary glances into those of ill-concealed latent love and tender admiration, and she was completely shattered to be told one day that he was leaving the house. To her bitter disappointment, not a word of regret at leaving did the lodger utter when she brought him his breakfast on that last much dreaded morning. He just ate it hurriedly and in silence. Rebecca followed him to the door with some of his luggage, still hoping for some sign of affection, and then came the thunderbolt. Instead of the fond words she had expected him to say, he merely thanked her for the services she had rendered, and casually slipped a golden guinea into the hand 
which was held out for him to squeeze. Then, with a brief nod, he got into his chase and without another word or glance was driven rapidly away. This was too much for poor Rebecca. The other residents of the house and neighbors looked on in bewilderment as a suddenly demented girl screaming violently and beating the air with her arms rushed wildly after the vehicle in a vain attempt to overtake it. It was at this juncture that Rebecca's mind gave way. Being given money in lieu of the love she had been hoping for was sufficient to turn her brain. She was overtaken and stopped in her berserk ch chase, and not it being discovered that she had actually gone mad, she was at once taken to the hospital of the Star of Bethlehem, still clutching tightly in her palm the golden guinea. Rebecca remained in the asylum for the rest of her life, dying there an old woman. What makes her case unusually pathetic is the fact that all through her long incarceration she never once parted with her golden guinea. Sleeping and waking she always held it grasped tightly in one hand. Before dying she expressed a wish that it should be laid with her in her coffin, but she had not long drawn her last breath before an unscrupulous keeper, biding his opportunity, pried the coin from her dead fingers and pocketed it. Consequently she was buried without the coin. It was then that a new horror in the form of a ghost was added to the frightful lives of the inmates of Bedlam. Shortly after Rebecca's death, strange noises were heard in the madhouse at night. Footsteps and the opening of doors, some of which were locked on the inside, and more. Sometimes in the daytime and sometimes at night, the ghost of Rebecca was seen, a lean figure with ghastly white cheeks and wild eyes, gliding about corridors and rooms and up and down staircases, seemingly always hunting with never abating feverishness for her precious purloined golden guinea. There were also several reported incidents of cell doors being opened and the apparition standing staring at the inmates, while on more than one occasion a keeper was scared almost out of his senses by Rebecca's wraith suddenly appearing there before him and exclaiming in hollow tones, my guinea give me back my guinea needless to say the guinea was never given back and the hauntings continued over a very long period rebecca's apparition manifesting itself to patients and staff alike it should be borne in mind that the patients apart these officially recorded reports came from witnesses of a very certain type at that time, the asylum attendants could scarcely be described as credulous and whimsical in themselves or very considerate of others. They were chosen generally for their hard-headedness and brute strength in dealing with the roughest of inmates, and anything of flesh and blood would have received their swift and emphatic attention. If they saw a ghost, then a ghost it most certainly was. During the time of Rebecca's confinement in the asylum, it had moved to a new building at the junction of the Lambeth and Kensington Roads, and it was here that her ghostly wanderings caused many an upset. In 1924, the asylum moved again to another home at Denmark Hill, where it amalgamated with the Maudsley Hospital, and Rebecca moved with it, for a white-faced, wild-eyed ghost continued to be seen, still searching for her golden guinea. When I applied for permission to make a renewed investigation of the hauntings, my request was refused. Though the cruel conditions at Bedlam had by then been considerably improved, I cannot honestly say that I was truly sorry at this decision.